That's better. Uh, one announcement. A BlackBerry smartphone was found just a few minutes ago in the women's bathroom in this building, Blackwell. I'm assuming it's somebody that's uh, dis discarding it for a new iPhone. <laughs> I lost it. I went here by mistake. Because you'd never give up a 4G phone for a 3G phone. Who would do that? Uh, if, you, if it is your phone, if you've um, le left it, Miss Jan Evans in the back has the phone. Please see her. Or you can see her tomorrow at the, in the business school. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Paul Barrett. I'm the Dean of the College of Business and Economics here at Longwood University. I welcome you to the third of four executive residence programs this academic year. With the college's mission of preparing students to be tomorrow's citizen leaders, we cannot think of a better way to help us accomplish this mission than to bring to campus some of the most successful value, values-based leaders in the country. Tonight's guest speaker is a successful business leader, and his company's DNA is infused with a set of core values that have literally sustained its growth. Integrity, respect, initiative, and innovation are just four of the seven values embraced by the employees in our speaker's firm. We are about to learn of the CEO's vision of values and his unyielding approach towards excellence. Yes, we are very fortunate to have him with us this evening. Our executive residence series began in the year 1991, and it continues to be an important program for learning for our students, faculty, staff, and our community partners. With the theme of this year's series, Leadership Values, we will be learning more about how one of the greatest social experiments known as the United States of America continues to establish organizations that provide valued leadership in Virginia and around the world. In this regard, tonight's speaker will address the topic, Coke Can Philosophy, the cornerstone of our success. Tonight's event is sponsored by Barrett Capital Management and Sun Trust Bank. And we thank these gracious sponsors for bringing the most distinguished and influential leaders to Longwood. Our sponsors provide this opportunity so we can peek in on our speakers' experiences and their insights on innovation and corporate and social responsibility including the pr protection of the most precious of all the organizational assets, the human capital that spans international boundaries. When I think of our speaker this evening, I'm reminded of the remarks made by Hugh Goldthorpe and Bill Gravitt in their book, I've Always Looked Up to Giraffes. The author said, and I quote, carbon paper doesn't last very long. Their point is really a lesson we can all learn from, and that is this. When we try to emulate or copy others, we, like carbon paper, will eventually wear thin and wear out. To underline this lesson, Goldthorpe and Gravitt cited a real-life experience with Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who preached a sermon entitled, Be Yourself. In his sermon, Dr. Peale stated that we are each unique individuals. No two of us are alike, and we must use our talents to the best of our abilities. Some of us may have more or less talent than others. That's okay, because what is key in all of this is that we know ourselves, be true to ourselves, admit our strengths, admit our limitations, but focus on what is good and strong in each of us. In this manner, we can, we will, and we do make a difference. Tonight's guest speaker is an amazing, amazing example of an executive who has clearly embraced the power of making a difference. It is evidence in how he has changed lives and communities for the better. I feel very fortunate to have the special privilege of getting to know this leader personally. I know from our time together that he has built a company with a unique business model. It is one that demonstrates that if you focus on the employees and the customers, the profits will take care of themselves. We have a real leader in our midst this evening and he's about to share his values-based philosophy with us. I thank him in advance for sharing his story with us. But before our speakers int introduce, I'd like to recognize our financial sponsors for tonight's program. If you would please stand from Barrett Capital Management, we have with us David Barrett, the CEO. <clears throat> and we, we also have Ashley Barrett, former administrative assistant to the CEO, you have to stand, Ashley. <laughs> Ashley is a Longwood alumna. 
And she's a proud mom to David Barrett's first granddaughter, Temple. Also, I'd like to recognize two other people who are clearly making a difference here at Longwood. We have with us this evening, and I ask you to stand briefly, the President of Longwood University and the First Lady of Longwood, General Patrick and Mrs. Joan Finnegan. I'd also like to recognize the Student Sponsoring Association for tonight's event. Will the College of Business and Economics Accounting Association members please stand up? Accountants rule, thank you future CPAs. <laughs> Finally, it is my pleasure to present to you tonight the individual who will introduce our guest speaker. Ms. Victoria, St Victoria Stagel is a senior at Longwood, originally from Kingsland, Georgia, who will be completing the Bachelor of Science and Business Administration degree in accounting in May of this year. As president of the Accounting Association, she has been working diligently to manage meetings and a series of activities in a very busy student association. And she has fit this activity into a schedule that has also included work with the Dean Student Advisory Board, being a resident hall technology associate and treasurer, and in her spare time, she has toured prospective students, families, and others around campus as a Longwood, Longwood ambassador. During the last several semesters, she has been recognized on the dean's list, and she will graduate in May with an expected 3.70 GPA. Through each of these activities, Victoria has learned and applied solid leadership and teamwork skills, marking her for a very fast track, mobile, upwardly uh, mobile career upon graduation and her chosen field of accounting. Please join me in welcoming to the podium one of our best students and soon to be one of our favorite alumna, Victoria Stegel. Good evening. How often have you been responsible for another person's life? Tonight's speaker has been directly involved in ensuring the safety of the lives of thousands of people. Starting as a firefighter, he became involved in fire, fire safety and prevention. Through a combination of specialized knowledge and business intuition, he co-founded Eagle Fire Consulting. He now uses his over 30 years of experience to lead and assure quality standards in everything they do. Tonight's speaker is a man who has personally fought fires and knows that any job concerning safety cannot be taken too seriously. He incorporates a code of ethics into both his business and personal life and only hires employers, employees who do the same. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the third 2010 and 2011 College of Business and Economics Executive and Resident Series guest speaker, Mr. Harry Hoffman. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Dean Barrett. Uh, Appreciate the opportunity and uh, the honor, actually, to speak uh, to this great group. President and First Lady, Mr. Patrick Finnegan, and his wife, Joan. Uh, gosh, you got a great foundation to work on here. This is going to be fun. And I look forward to spending more time with you and your school. Um, Dr. Mary Flanagan, the Finnegan, Flanagan, I knew I was going to mess that one up. <laughs> Thought we're getting to the uh, Notre Dame, we're Irish here or somewhere. Thank you and Victoria for navigating me through the day. It's been a long day. It's been a fun day. The students are great. I'm glad to see the students came tonight. The talk I gave in the classroom today is going to be different this evening. We are really going to stress core values. Before I start, though, I wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for a person in this room who's very special to me. It's my wife. They get a little emotional here because I'm alive. Because of her. I'm a cancer survivor. I'm going into my eighth year. I was one month away from probably dying had I not married her. And I was a bachelor until that day. So God dropped her into my life to save my life, to be here tonight in front of you. And I guess it's okay for grown men to cry. 
Let's see, who does that? There's somebody else famous. It was a very nice opening that I got from everyone. Um, look, I just am the head of the ship. I try to give a direction. I don't do this by myself. I have a team. Part of my team's here tonight. Ray Clark, J.R. Kane from Charlotte. They drove all the way up here to be with us tonight. Tom Herman, the co-founder. Where are you, Tommy? Tommy Herman and I were the first two in 1987 along with one other person. We had no customers. We had a dream. Tommy and I had the same core values. They're not mine. We both believe the same. Actually, his probably were a little stronger than mine. Seriously. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, the Cocaine philosophy. How I really bought into that and we gave it a, a, a name that we could remember. In 1987, we started a company. It was December 14th. Again, we had three employees. We had a letter of credit from one of your sponsors, SunTrust, who's still my bank. They gave us $125,000 and believed in us. Just a business plan. Believed in something written on paper. But not only that, they believed in the value system that we have, and they believed in our resume that we brought to the table. Tommy was a professional firefighter for 16 years before he went into the fixed fire protection side. He saw a lot of death. He fought a lot of fires, a lot more than I have. We signed in 1988 20 inspection contracts to do inspection and testing of fire protection systems. Today, we still have 16 of those 20. 24 years later, we've grown to almost 100 employees. We went from two states to seven states. Through 2008 and 2009, one of the worst recessions that I've seen and others have seen, but we doubled our business through 2008-2009. I think it was about six months ago I gave a talk on ethics. How, can ethical companies survive in these times? And I think that proves if you're a highly ethical company and you stick to your core values, you can succeed. Could we have been much larger? Oh yeah. If I would have just thrown the core values aside, if I would have just ignored our vision and mission statement, if I'd have been just like everybody else. We have a drug-free workforce. We have good driving records. That means a lot. Some of you heard me talk about it in class today. We have background checks. We hire people with the same core values we have. We train them to provide life-saving services. People ask me, what do you do for a living? We save lives. That's what we do. Very simplistic. But we do it by keeping our eye on the ball. And eye on the ball is our core values. We have a vision, mission, and core value statement. You know, when we first started to write this, it was check the box. Everybody has one of these. You've got to have it on the wall somewhere so anybody comes in. It has to be on your website. But as we were writing, I said, wait a minute. You can't make somebody have these values. They have to bring it with to you. You can't just write it and say you're going to do it. You're going to believe in it. You're going to buy into it. So what did we do? We didn't write the core values. Bruce Austin, Vice President of Technical Operations. Dave Miller, Vice President Administration. Myself. Tom Herman. We, as management, were not going to be involved in the core values. We set out a plain piece of paper and gave it to everyone from a helper to our most senior person in the company in the field. And we said, here, we want you to write what Eagle Fire means to you as far as a core value in servicing your customer. They did that. We put them all together. And in here, each one of these core values that we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about three tonight, 
Not all of them. But everyone that's on here has a quote from the person who wrote it. So when it's hanging on the wall, which we have a big one, they can take a new team member and say, I wrote that. Look, that's my quote. I did the safety part. It's not Harry. I can't force that upon them. We just have to make sure we hire good people who embody the philosophy we want them to have. We need them to understand they're saving lives. Tiffany knows I'm off script, and I knew it would be. <laughs> and I'm going to be, but I'll get back on it. I think this is the most important part to set the stage tonight. I couldn't make, and I can't make anyone believe these. They have to have that inside of them. They have to bring it to the table. But we can teach the other things. So tonight we're going to talk about pride, we're going to talk about knowledge, and we're going to talk about ethics. But before that, let's talk about Longwood a little bit. This building we're in, very historical building, looked like this April 2001. That's what it looked like April 2001 after a spark. It doesn't take much to burn and to destroy something historic or destroy a life. It goes quickly. Fire doubles every minute exponentially. And that's what's left. Destruction. Luckily it was just destruction of property. No death. But there was firemen, there were other people at risk to contain that so it didn't spread to the other part of the college. And then you rebuilt this beautiful structure, this landmark. You found the old drawings and you were able to put it back the way it was. You didn't let that fire destroy part, a very important part of Longwood University. This is why Tom and I formed this company. We didn't like this part. We didn't like the part with the dead bodies. Now the Coke can philosophy, we're going to start with a story. It starts in 1988, around that time, at Fort Lee. Now Tom was big. He said, Harry, we've got to have a broom. We got to have this rat tail and we got to have this dustpan on every truck. That's the time we only have two trucks. Well, it's going to be on yours and mine. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, Tom, what are we going to do with these? He said, when we go into the valve room, we're going to clean it up. I said, oh, okay. Well, I, yeah, you know, he says, do you do that every time you go out? I said, well, I'm, yeah, I'm going to pick the trash up and stuff, but how far are we going to go with this thing? What are we going to call it? The broom rat tailed dustpan thing? I said, I don't know what it's going to be called. But it hit me. I was working at Fort Lee, Virginia. I was in a valve room. A valve room is where the riser comes in, the water for the sprinkler system. Very important to have the water. The sprinkler system means nothing if you don't have any water. So, as I was working on this valve in the valve room in the corner over here, as you can see, I'm sorry, the picture's not any better than that, but... And I'm saying in here, we have quality assurance evaluators, call them QAEs. They're going to monitor what I do. They told me it's 100% QAE on you, because we're going to make sure it's done right. I said, okay. So I'm in a room, and I'm working on this. He walks in, he says, how's things going? I said, well, they're going good. He said, well, don't forget to take your lunch and put it in a trash can and clean, clean that up. I turned, and I said, wait a minute. And then I shut up. What was I going to say? I was going to tell them it wasn't mine. How am I going to tell somebody who walked in and sees me standing there that it's not mine? It hit me. It doesn't matter. If I walked in there and it's there, I now own it. Wow, what a concept. It hit me. Tommy was trying to tell me what that broom and rat tail and dustpan was for. 
We own it. Now, where it really drove home is that when I completed the room, I got my broom, I got my rat tail, and I cleaned it. I even cleaned the top of the air handling unit. I don't own that, but there was dust up there, so I cleaned it too, put it in the dustpan, got it out. Had a nice spick and span when I left, closed the door, and I was happy. Went on to a couple more buildings, did a couple more buildings, did a couple more cleanings. QAE guy comes up, he says, Harry, did you clean that valve room that you were in? I said, yes, sir. Did, did you see something in there? He said, no, but why did you clean it so good? I said, what, I said, what do you mean? He says, you cleaned everything. He said, I'm not going to tell you to clean anything anymore. He said, are you taking care of our systems as well as you take care of that room? I said, yes, sir. I said, probably better because it's more important. That's going to save lives. The trash I took out is not. So that leads us to the, the point where I realized that what Tommy was trying to tell me with the broom, the rat tail, and the dustpan, that, it was, that was more important in the service we were providing. It put the exclamation point on it. So here we go again. I get a phone call. Am I in the right place here? Yes. Okay. I'm going to get to phone call from a president of a company. He says, you always get bad calls, don't you, Harry? I said, yeah, most of the time. I said, is this another one? He said, no, 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 this is a good one. I said, okay. He said, your guys were in here last week, and no one has ever come into my office and looked at my sprinkler heads. He said, number two, I didn't even know I had sprinkler heads in my office because I don't think I ever looked up to see them. I always went to my desk for 20 years, back the same way. But your guys walked in and looked at my sprinkler heads, explained to me, and educated me to why they were there and what they would do and how they operate. And as they started to walk out, I looked and they had left some grease and dirt on my carpet. And I turned to them and looked at them and I said, guys, you did a great job except now you've dirtied my carpet. And they looked down and they said, no problem. Now this is what the president is telling me on the phone, no problem. Well, this is good because I had empowered them to fix what we messed up. They called one of our service providers, told the president that we needed his office for a couple hours. He left for the day. We went in and we cleaned the carpet from wall to wall, not just the area that we dirtied. The reason he was calling me to tell me, he says, I opened the door the next day, turned the light on, and he said, oh my God, they put new carpet in here. He says, it's never been cleaned in 20 years. <laughs> and that's all he was wanting to talk about. And he says, and the irony of this whole thing is, is this, Harry. He said, and, I, I, and he was passionate, like I'm talking right now. And I'm, I'm like, man, this is great. I can hear him. I don't even have to have the phone near me. He says, I just happened to get your invoice for your services. I said, no, we didn't charge you to clean the carpet. He said, no, 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 no. This is for your inspection services. He said, it's been sitting on, I guess it was on my desk. Maybe you guys put it on there. I don't know, but I'm signing it now, and that's why I'm calling you. That stimulated me to call you. In fact, the invoice was there, and I had the phone number, and I had access to you. But the main thing is, I didn't know my carpet was that dirty. <laughs> and I want to pay you for that, too. And I said, no, sir, you have paid me by signing a contract and being one of our partners and us to be allowed to be a partner with you. It's not a customer. He's someone that we want to save lives and save his property. So if Eagle touches it, we own it. Now, can you apply that in your regular life? Can you apply it in any business? Yes, if you touch it, you own it. That's how we make decisions, too. If we're going to take over a system, if there's something wrong with it, we get together as a team and say, can we accept the liability? Can we accept the fact that it may not work? Can we accept what's wrong with the system? Because once we touch it, all the problems belong to Eagle Fire. I can't say it was the other company. I can't say it was the other guy. 
We now own it. Oh my God. This philosophy of cleaning up has now gone to something else. If we walk in, we own the trash. Now if we touch something, we own it. This thing's growing a life of its own. So we end up doing the unexpected. That president didn't expect his office to be clean wall to wall. But that's what we wanted him to feel. We wanted him to have that experience. He didn't expect us to clean it wall to wall. He thought he'd have a nice little white area that's cleaned and the rest of the office be dirty. Really, at the end of that conversation, he said, hold it, postscript. I said, what is that? He said, I've got to paint my walls now because they look pretty dingy. <laughs> So we leave it better than we found it. Very important. No matter what you do. No matter what you touch. Through all this, we're building loyalty. We're building our reputation. And we're building a brand. And that brand is important. We didn't have the Eagle Fire brand that you saw earlier when we started this company. Tommy Atelia and, and a couple of other people that have been here a long time, we were copying eagles from Winston Pack, the side of a Winston cigarette pack, you know, a little eagle on the side of that, put it on our letterhead. We had a name, Eagle Fire Protection Services. We thought that explained what we did. In 1991, I said, you know what? We had too many things we were pointing at, and we need to be all going in the same direction. We need to be aligned, and we need something to be aligned with. We need something we can build a brand with. We need to be something we're proud of. So I went out with no money and hired a branding firm for $6,000 in 1992. And Tom Herman, my partner, thought I was crazy. Didn't you, Tom? Still does, but that's fine. I will be till I die. So we branded Eagle Fire. We got the intellectual property done. Then as we went along, we said, wait a minute. I said, gosh, our brand was the Eagle, Eagle Fire in a red line. That was, our, that was what I branded. I forgot to brand the name Eagle Fire. So then I went back and when I went to my intellectual property attorney, she says, you not only forgot to brand Eagle Fire, you forgot to break it out and brand Eagle and Eagle Fire and then the logo as a total. So I now have three brandings. And part of what we're trying to do, if you look at this hat, it's Eagle Fire in the back, right? But it's an eagle on the front. A lot of people see that eagle and what do they think of? Eagle Fire. They don't have to see the name underneath anymore. And part of what we wrote in our business plan back in 1987 is we wanted to be the UPS of fire protection. We wanted to be as good as they were. We wanted to be as highly recognizable as they are. Well, how do you do that? UPS didn't have, they started out with United Parcel Service on their truck. Then they went to a little package with a ribbon on it, UPS, UPS, because we all said, Hey, call ups. And they rebranded herself because the customer rebranded them. Well, the customer called us Eagle Fire. Our branding company bought into that. And now the Eagle is our, is our brand. And the value system is our brand. When they look at that, they look at the value system that we bring to the table. The drug-free workforce. The committed, loyal team members that we have, the knowledge-based technicians. I did it good and went right into knowledge base. Another story. Went to pick up the phone one day, and I always dreaded when I picked up the phone that I might intercept a call, and I did. Picked up the phone, no dial tone. Good afternoon. Eagle Fire, Harry Hoffman speaking. How may I help you? Ed, how you doing? Great. Yeah. You want Jeff Cook? Uh, what, do you, what do you need Jeff for? Fire alarm system. You've got to take it out of service. What are you doing over there? Okay. All right, just can you hold on a second? Yeah, just, just hold on a second. I, I, it, no, Jeff's not here, but let me look it up in, the, in our database system. So I put the phone down for a minute, pulled up our database system, pulled up the customer, went back into our electronic technician, which tells all the things about the customer. Fire alarm system, remove 
wire 16 and 17 and put a wire nut on it so it doesn't fall back into the panel and short circuit it. Ed, it's 16 and 17. He says, yeah, and the wire nuts, I know. I said, you got 16 and 17 now? Yes. Ed, Ed, you need to go back and go ahead and do that because you got people waiting there. If you want to call back later, we'll talk about the database system. Yeah, I know we have a lot of information. I'll talk to you later, Ed, okay? Go, don't forget the wire nuts. All right, good. All right, bye. Intercepted a call. That's how I handled it. Real life. I wanted to build, as part of our future, the largest fire protection database in the United States. And we started doing that. He just confirmed that that had value to him. He wants to call back. He called back and talked to me for a half hour. He wanted to know what we had in our system about him. Today we have moved to the next level. Everything we do goes to a database data clip. We have gone electronic. We don't have paper anymore. When we're done, it's in there. We know real time the report, the condition, discrepancy. We have, t we have salespeople who are calling the customer and saying, you have this deficiency and your system will not operate. We need to come fix it real time so that somebody doesn't lose their life because a system is out of service. So this is back then that caused me to look forward into the future of what we needed to invest in. We invested a half million dollars in technology last year alone and deployed it to the field to our technicians to better serve our customer, to have knowledge. How many of you in here have called somebody to find something out only to hear this? You want to speak to Joe. Joe's not here. When's he going to be back? Oh, he's gone for two weeks on vacation. Well, can I speak to someone else that could help me? No one else can help you but Joe. Did anyone ever have that experience in this room? Well, my God, as a consumer, I don't want the people that I partner with to have that experience. I want that database to be the center of our universe. Anyone in the company that has access to that database can look at that customer and answer most questions. A lot of times they're looking for their last inspection report because the fire marshal's sitting in their office and they forget where they put it. They're nervous. We get on, click, it's emailed to them. Done. We want to be a knowledge-based company. That database system is leading us towards that knowledge-based company. We want to learn from our customers and also put that in our database. We want to know as much about them as we can possibly know to better serve them. To learn one thing new daily is what we task our technical people and ourselves to do. If you learn one new thing daily, you'll be better than you were yesterday. That's that knowledge base. And be innovative. Do, again, the unexpected. Think out of the box. Come up with new ways to do the things that we do every day. Another story. was presenting an inspection contract to a customer. We have SOP, standards of performance, for the work that we do on every system. I don't give them the price, I just say give them the SOPs, I hold the price over here, so we're talking. Customer gets his pen out and he's drawn through, he says, Harry, he says, I don't want to do three, five, seven, and nine, how much will that save me? And I said, can I see that please? I took the SOP, the contract I had in front of him, put it with mine, put it back in my folder, and I said, I'm going to save you a lot of money. It's not going to cost you anything. We're not going to work for you. He's like, you're not going to work for me? I said, no, sir. I said, you asked me to lower the bar. The codes that we operate under are min, max, minimum, and maximum for enforcement, minimum to make sure your systems work. Our bar started there. Our bar is up here because we added manufacturer's instruction and will it save lives and property. So everyone's taught to stay where that bar is. And he looked at me and he says, oh, can we talk? I said, sure. He said, that's what I've been doing. He said, everybody comes in here and asks me to do something. I, I've been lowering the bar. I said, yeah, you can do that. Then the other guy, he wants to go lower than this guy. He said, I've lowered the bar through my whole company. I didn't know what was going on. So we talked for a good solid hour on the philosophy of lowering the bar. 
that was more impactful to him than the actual work we were doing or going to do to his fire protection system. So we were on to something. These, these values that we embody and that we believe in and to say no, that is huge. No is a powerful word. So, we have to make sure that under ethics, that we treat everyone, whether they're a $100 customer or a $100,000 customer, the same, because we got the bar here for both of them. We don't lower the bar for the 100 and we don't raise it for the 100000 They get the same service. We follow manufacturer's instructions and code. My technical people come from various companies. They'll tell you, they were told, just get it done. Do it any way you can. Or do it this way this time, do it this way that time. That's confusing. There's no alignment there. So I made it simple. Manufacturer's instruction comes with every piece of equipment we use. Read it. Follow it. Do it that way. Also the code. Follow the code. And there's no gray area in inspections. Integrity, we're not willing to compromise our standards just to get a job. We could be three or four times our size if we were willing to do that. We're not. Too much at stake. Learn to say no when it's not right. Recap. Again, pride. We touch it. We own it. Information is power. Ethics, do not lower the bar, learn to say no. Those are so, so important. Mission statement, to create lifelong relationships with each of our clients by delivering high quality services with emphasis on consistency, integrity, knowledge, and safety, and above all, an unyielding approach towards results. That is a key, approach towards results. We stay there till it's fixed. We don't leave at 3.30 and then come back tomorrow. We don't leave you without protection. We stay there and do it until you are safe. And then the last part, which is a quote from me, while others are content with technical compliance, that's that part where, yeah, we technically have done it. We're not. We're only satisfied with incident-free outcomes. We don't want to see a building burn down, and we don't want to see a life lost. In just the past two weeks prior to coming here, we've had three activations of sprinkler systems at our customers. We had no loss of life, we had no loss of property, and only one sprinkler head activated and put the fire out. They were back in service, one was an apartment complex. You've seen a lot of fires on the news lately. You didn't see these. You know why you don't see these? Because it's not cool. It's not neat. It's not exciting. Gosh, wouldn't it be cool if they covered that? A sprinkler head actually put a fire out and saved a life and saved some property? Wouldn't that be neat? Instead of showing you the destruction and loss of life? But they don't promote that. But we have to do that. We have to continue to promote that all the time. I want to summarize the Cocan philosophy. The name, we finally gave it a name. We had the broom, we had the rat tail, we had the dustpan. We taught all of our technical people to do these things and we really didn't have a good name for it that they could remember. And we just came up with a Coke can, kind of a metaphor to what we were trying to do. Coke can philosophy, stuck with them, it's easy. They can remember it and they know what it means. It's not just cleaning that room. What else does it mean? You've already learned it tonight. You touch it, you own it. Good, we're, we're getting those takeaways. That is real important, no matter what you do in life. But it's really important in what we do. Very important, because we have the responsibility of lives 
and property. Now, I'll tell you a story that absolutely blew me away. This culture that we were creating within Eagle Fire, from the Coke can philosophy that we now have a name for, from the first day we started in 1988, I didn't know what we were doing. It evolved, but it evolved and got bigger than I thought it could ever be. We have three men, three team members that report to a chemical plant every day. We don't see them. They go there. They don't have a supervisor looking over them. It's out in the middle of nowhere. We went to visit them, introducing a new manager into the company as I traveled around to different offices and we went to this chemical plant to meet with the site manager for their maintenance operations and the safety director. We went into the office, sat down with them, had a great 30 minute meeting. Wonderful. We were doing everything right. Our guys were wonderful. We didn't have to worry about them. They could come in a plant any time of day or night. We don't have to be there anymore. And they come in and fix the systems when they're down. And I used to have to come in and sit there, he said. We just give them the key. They come back. We know in the morning when they get there, it's going to be done. It's going to be done right. And we don't have to follow up on it. Boy, these are all great things. So we're near the end. We want to go see our team members. So we start to walk out the door. And I get over here and I look back. And they didn't get up. Usually, they would get up. <laughs> and I'm saying, is there something else you have to say? They looked at each other and they looked at us and said, yes. And I said, oh, man. All those nice things and now here comes the other shoe. So we sit back down. They said, we don't know how to tell you this. And, um, my heart's beating like it is right now. And they said, your guys come in here every day with a positive attitude. Your guys come in here every day with a can-do attitude. Your guys come in here every day and they do what they're supposed to do. They tell us when they're done what to do, what they've done. They ask us if there's something else we need to do before we leave. But our 45 maintenance people come in, slide out the back door, they got a bad attitude and all those other things, right? Not anymore. I said, what do you mean not anymore? What have we done? He said, your three men have changed the culture of the 45 maintenance people we have in this plant. They come in in the morning with a smile on their face. They come in the morning, they've shaved, as your guys do. They come in the morning and they're dressed properly. They come in the morning and ask... How's the day going and what do we got to do? At the end of the day, you come in and say, is there anything we need to do before we go? We're sitting here, how did this happen? And we look back and it was your three guys that they were emulating. I got goosebumps right now just thinking about that story. That is a wow moment in your 24 history of your company. That you can actually, three people can actually change the culture and they buy into it and look up to them. So I said, wow, thank you so much. They got up this time first, <laughs> so we knew it was over. We got to walk out the door. We're going to go talk to our guys. Mr. President of Eagle Fire, how you doing? I'm one of your guys. I'm Eagle Eyes. No, I can't come out from behind. You see, I'm only eagle eyes from the waist up. No, come on, come on out and talk to me. No, I can't. I'm only eagle eyes from the waist up. And I'm like, waist up? Yeah, I'm wearing jeans, and you can't wear jeans at Eagle Fire. But he had our hat on. He was eagle eyes from the waist up. A word that we now use, eagle eyes. My God, he's working for somebody else, but now he wants to be an eagle guy. He's wearing our hat. And he's looking around the corner, and he wasn't playing. I mean, he really meant what he said. So that just was an exclamation point on that culture change that we did and that those three guys did in the plane. Not me. Nice introduction tonight. Harry the leader. Harry this. Harry that. Tom this. Tom that. Everybody. It was those three men. We didn't stand there and say, do this. They did it on their own. They set the example. They were the leaders of this company. 
They represented the brand we're trying to build. In the postscript of that, we were in negotiation, very tough negotiation, for an extension of a five-year contract that was worth six figures. Actually, seven figures, sorry. I remember someone selling. They always want to sell another contract with two commas, not one. <laughs> And it, they usually make a decision pretty quick. We've been there 15 years. It was, what, almost three and a half months. We were worried. But it was someone who didn't know Eagle Fire who was now pulling the strings on the money. But these gentlemen that we talked to were the ones who were critical in getting us and crucial in getting us that contract. And how they got it is that story. You can't throw Eagle Fire out. If you do, you'll throw the culture out of the plant. And we got the contract awarded for five more years. So can a highly ethical company be successful? Can you hire the right people highly ethical and be successful? What is the answer? Say it's yes. Thank you. Make me eagle eyes you get up here. <laughs> Come on, none of us will bite. Questions, anybody? Ashley. Right, did you prompt her for that one? <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember that answer. You said you could, you could take my place. No. Um, what we do is that's what we look for first. We, we have our team members try to bring people to us because they're going to bring like to us and we give them a $500 bonus if they bring someone who has that value set that we're looking for. No tattoos. Seriously, no tattoos. They have to have a good MVR. Why? Some of you heard this in the classroom today. Some of you want to tell them why we can't have, come on, someone in the classroom today. I, saw, I see a lot of faces right. in the classroom. Right here. Why? That's the next thing. Who taught me that? Jennifer Lindsay, right here, Rutherford Company. Been my insurance, vice president of, of Rutherford, now uh, LLC which is part of Marsh, for a long time. Two speeding tickets in a year, and next event's going to be what, Jennifer? An accident. And it always is. Well, I've looked at 1,000 MVRs because of Jennifer teaching me this, and we get an MVR first before I even interview them. And I look on here, two speeding tickets, and I flip over, oop, accident. Oop, DUI. It is it. Is it. They're gone. They don't even have a chance. They can't even get in the door. Guess what? Jennifer's good at saying no, too. Jennifer, this person's really, really good. They had a speeding ticket in January and they had another one just about January again. She says, what do you mean just about January again? Well, it was like October. She says, Harry, get off the phone. They're gone. <laughs> <laughs> they can't touch a key. So she says no. That keeps us honest. So we do that, MVR. Then a background check, because now today, the companies we work for require a background check. Well, why do I perform a background check then if I gotta have a company that we're working for gonna perform another background check? Well, I'm not gonna send them someone who can't pass a background check. That would be absolutely ludicrous. So what I do is we do a background check so that when we send somebody, it doesn't matter who they are, we have to background check everyone, because we don't know who's going where. We can't say, oh, only you four are going to get background checks. And if we get someone who has to have a background check, only you four are going to go do that because you're only four that can do that. But I have competition that does that. We don't. Everybody is going to pass a background check. You don't, you're gone. We had one slip by us. We, fought, we, we went down immediately when we found out. Got the letter in the mail. It was a felon. Committed a crime with a gun. 
We went to the site he was working and we actually removed him immediately, left the truck there, locked it and parked it. Gone. Soon as we found out. That was a hard thing to do, but we can't, you can't close your eyes and say, well, we'll let him go at 5 o'clock. No. As soon as that letter was open, we were en route two and a half hours away. So we do, if we talk to talk, we are walking to talk also. More questions? Harry was kind enough to be in two of my classes today, and I wanted him to share a story related to the Cocan on how selling a set of skis helped you in a pivotal moment, uh, which is really uh, interesting. I thought they'd enjoy. Not many, not many people even in my company know, so I hope they see this somewhere. Uh, Tommy knows the story of the skis. Remember I was selling the skis? Went to Chip, I think it was Chip Hall with uh, Crestar. Is anybody here from SunTrust? Do we have anyone? Okay, you're not if you're watching when you see this. Thank you, SunTrust. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I have a great relationship with SunTrust. In the business plan process, we wrote a business plan on a compact Desk Pro 2, 1985 vintage. They just put one in the Smithsonian. I have one of the original ones in my office training room, and it still works. The screen's that big, just a little bit bigger than the screen on this phone, and it's green, it's kind of hard to see. I can't believe we wrote a business plan on that, but we did. So we have that business plan. It has to be shopped to someone. So we shopped it to banks. Let me tell the story real quick. The bank, one bank, yeah, I don't, I don't like your, yeah, that's weak. Yeah, we're not going to loan you money. Get the guy back. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I looked at your plan and you want $125,000? You're crazy. So that guy, I took the business plan and walked away from. The other bank we went to, they had written all over my business plan. Did I turn my mic off? Mic? Written all over the business plan. Changed things. They were sitting down with me and saying, hey, guess what? What you need to do is change your marketing strategy. You need to do this. You need to do that. And by the way, you only need $70,000. You don't need $120,000, $25,000. And you need to do this and do that. And as I told him, I said, can I see the plan, please? And as I saw it, I picked it up, put it in my briefcase, and walked out. A bank. They're retail. They're selling money. They're selling money, getting the interest, doing it over and over again. But as I walked out, I got in a car. Tommy thought I was crazy. He says, oh, we're going to get the money now. I said, we're going to the next one. Went in. We, we put the plan together. It, they looked at it. It was Crestar. They were very, very happy with their plan. They liked it. They liked the resume. They liked uh, everything about it. They said it was well done. Ask some questions because he's got to go in front of this committee to present it to get the money for us. That Friday, after, I think it was a Monday or Tuesday that we presented this thing to him, and it was going to the to the loan committee on that following Monday or something. Friday got a phone call. I put a pair of Rosinol skis with 727 bindings on it. Those of you who ski probably know who that is. It's a long time ago. Almost old as my computer. Probably why I have these bad knees. Guy called me up and said, I'd like to buy those Rosinols. I said, sure. I said, he said, how can I get them? I said, where do you live? He said, well, I live in the West End. I said, well, give me your address. I'm on my way to the West End. He said, you'll bring me the skis? I said, yeah. You want to buy them from me? I'm going to bring them to you. So I did. Went to his house, pulled out front, took the skis in. He looked at me. He said, oh, man, these, these things are like new. He said, I'm just going to write you the check for it. He says, what do you do? I said, well, I'm trying to get a loan, and uh, I'm you know, waiting on a business plan to, to start a business. I used to work for Figgy International, um, one of their companies, Automatic Sprinkler Corporation. He didn't say much. He's over there. Brought his check right out. I had these weird looking checks from Crestar. And I said, gosh, where do you get those kind of checks? He says, uh, you can't get those. Those are for executives. I said, so what do you do? He said, I'm Chip Hall. I'm, I'm the vice president in charge of small business. <laughs> 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 hmm. I said, then he looked at me and says, so what bank are you shopping this business plan to? I said, the guy writing on that executive check. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he looked at me and he said, I cannot believe this. He said, I never, you're the first person in my lifetime in this bank that I got to meet 
before I saw a business plan. Before we loaned money. I usually don't meet him ever. And he says, I got to meet you. And he says, you, he said, are you going to service your customers like you service me? And I kind of looked back at him and said, what do you think? I said, yes, sir. I'm going to do that. He said, now, if I didn't buy these skis, you told me my son could ski them. I said, you're right. And you were going to come back and pick them up on Sunday after we came back from skiing, even if I didn't want them. I said, that's right. He said, go ahead, write your name down on here so I don't forget it, and your name of your company. So when it comes in front of me, I said, I'm not guaranteeing you anything, but it's kind of moved up to the top of the stack when we have our meeting next week. Believe it or not, was it two weeks later? We got our letter in the mail. Letter of credit for $125,000. It was meant to be. But we are at that time still exhibiting a philosophy of how we were going to do business. We haven't changed. We still say no, and we're going to do that. And we're going to still service the customer no matter what it takes. We have guys drive all night to get somewhere to take care of something. We don't say no. Our guys on the phone don't say no. When they get to call at 3 in the morning, they get up and go. Thank you, Jim. Great question. Any other questions? All right. Well, <clears throat> I think we've learned a lot. At least I've learned a lot tonight. I knew, I knew a lot of this, but some of the stories were were new for me as well. Harry, thank you so much. I mean, I think you, as I said earlier in my introduction, I know, and I know this because I know some of the stories. You've changed lives and communities. Uh, your company uh, lives by doing the right thing. And this last story was, I think, the best of all. It just shows you that if you do the right thing, even before you have a need, uh, that need will be addressed appropriately. Harry, I thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you. The Fitty County Association. We just want to thank you for coming and spending your time at the um, College of Business and Economics and for talking to all of us and letting us spend some things with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This last gift, Harry, is a real special one to the business school and to Longwood University. Uh, we think that what you did today, all day in the classroom, and certainly tonight in grand style, was uh, you hit a home run for our students our faculty staff and our community partners. And this is actually uh, a home run baseball hit by Brant Jones against Richmond. And uh, we want you for hitting a home run for us. We give you this home run baseball. Thank you so much. And I thank you all for coming tonight. See you March 1st. There's another one. I want to thank all the students. It won't be as good as this one, but no, I want to thank all the good. students. You guys are great, and I'll tell you what, I am looking forward to the future now that I've met the students of Longwood University School of Business and Economics. Thank you.